Well, here we are at part 15 of the Complete Beginner's Guide to Mandolin, and wow, if you stuck with me this far, kudos to you. And you've kind of gotten your feet wet in a lot of really important categories here on the mandolin. You know, you've learned some chords, you've learned some melodies, you've learned some scales and exercises, a little bit of music theory, and basically from now on, all you'll be doing is expanding all those different categories through your practice time. So the basic idea is now that you've learned three major scales, eventually you want to work up to 12 major scales. Or now that you've learned 12 tunes, you eventually want to work up to 120 tunes and so on like that. But the hard thing now is you go from being a beginner to being an intermediate player is knowing how to manage those goals so that they don't seem overwhelming or too unattainable to stop you from even trying these things. So in this video, I want to give you seven practical practice tips that will help you progress faster with the time that you have on the mandolin. And let's just get started right now. And the first tip is consistency. And this is probably the hardest one of all. But the idea is that you want to try to practice about the same amount of time every day if you can. One of my favorite books that I've read recently is one called Atomic Habits by an author named James Clear. And at the beginning of this book, he talks about this fun concept called the aggregate of marginal gains. And that's just a fancy way of saying that if you practice something every day and you get 1% better at that thing every day that you practice, you may not notice that growth in your day-to-day -day life. But over the course of a year, if you practice every day, you'll get 365% better. <laughs> now that math may not actually work out, but the idea is that we're getting better every time we play our mandolin, even if we don't notice it. And if we're playing our mandolin every day, then we have more opportunities to grow and get better. So a real practical way of practicing consistency is just setting a daily practice time goal. In other words, we wanna to try to practice the mandolin about the same time every day. And obviously life happens and things get in the way of our practice routine, but if we get in the habit of practicing for 15 or 30 minutes a day or even an hour a day, all that practice is really gonna add up fast if we do it on a daily basis. So that's a question that you have to ask yourself personally. You know, how much time each day can I devote to the mandolin on a consistent basis? But I think that's really the ultimate secret to getting better. It's not that some people are more musically talented than others, it's just that some people practice a lot more than other people, right? <laughs> so along with consistency, tip number one, tip number two is focus. I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes when I come to play the mandolin, I just can't be bothered to be focused, right? I'll be slouching back on the couch and just kind of playing something, noodling around or playing poorly and not really keeping myself accountable for my practice time. And if I'm not focused, I know that I'm really wasting time ultimately. I'm not really making the most of this precious practice time that I have with the mandolin each day. So one thing that really helps me focus whenever I practice is practicing with a timer. Usually I'll set a timer for 10 or 15 minutes and just practice one topic for that amount of time. Then when that buzzer goes off, I'll shift gears and try practicing something different for another 10 or 15 minutes. And that's not a hard rule, right? You can play around with the amount of time or what you practice in those sessions. But for me, after 10 or 15 minutes, I start to see diminishing returns in my focus and productivity. And along with this idea of focus is the concept of making every single note that you play count. In other words, when you come to the practice room, we don't want to be practicing things poorly, otherwise we'll be building bad habits. So every time I come to practice, I kind of have to tell myself, okay, David, you know, we're setting the bar way up here. Obviously, you're still going to make mistakes, you're still going to have struggles, and you may not ever get to that high point there, but the more you shoot for that high standard, the closer you're going to get to it. So focus, you know what this feels like. I can't recommend that enough. On to tip three, which is memorize everything that you play from the very start. And memorization isn't a topic that we've talked about too much so far, but it's a really important one. You know, when you go out to that bluegrass or that old time jam, there aren't too many folks that are looking at a sheet of paper, right? Most of these people have these songs internalized and written on their hearts so that they can play it no matter where they are. I think that's great because looking at a piece of paper sometimes takes you out of the moment. You can't really enjoy the music or look around and listen to what other people are doing in the jam. And eventually down the line, as you learn more about improvisation and melodic variation, you're gonna wanna change these melodies up in the moment. So you don't wanna be tied to a specific arrangement of the melody. 
All these arrangements that we looked at so far are pretty much just starting places for you to use as melodic explorations. And we won't get into all that here, but all that to say, it's really important to memorize these melodies and these chord progressions right from the start. Even the scales and the exercises that we work with, if we can internalize those, they're gonna become a part of who we are as a musician. And here's a helpful practice technique for memorizing a tune. I really like breaking these tunes down into phrases, as you can probably tell from all the videos in this series, right? I like to look at two measures at a time and try to learn that first before moving on to the next two measures. And what I'd say from now on is try to memorize each two measures from the start. Instead of just playing through it enough so that you can play through it once or twice, see if you can actually memorize that two measure phrase before moving on to the next two measures. That way you don't have this temptation to keep using the page as a crutch. You wanna wean yourself away from that transcription as soon as possible. And here's a helpful added challenge that you can use for memorization, something I've heard called the rule of three. So as you're going through a tune and memorizing it in two measured chunks, you can use this rule of three idea as kind of a litmus test to let you know whether or not you have a phrase memorized. And here's how it works. You basically try to play through that phrase three times in a row from memory without making any mistake. And if you play through it twice in a row without making a mistake, but you make a mistake on the third time, you guess that you have to reset the count and start all over again. This way you're kind of adding an extra cost to the memorization challenge because if you do make a mistake, you'll have to play through the whole thing all over again. And it does help us focus. I think whenever we use challenges or games like this to keep our interest engaged. You can use that rule of three for all the two measure phrases in a tune, and then you can stitch the phrases together in four measure phrases and try the rule of three, or in eight measure phrases in the rule of three, and eventually you can try playing through the entire tune three times in a row from memory without making a mistake. It's a tall order, but it's definitely possible. All right, tip number four here is play along with a metronome or backing tracks as much as possible. You probably know this, but as humans, our natural rhythmic tendencies fluctuate, right? We tend to slow down or speed up depending on how much coffee we've drank or what we've had for lunch and stuff like that. So the more we can practice with steady outside references like a metronome or backing tracks, the more we're training up our own internal sense of rhythm, which is one of the most important things we can work on. And to play along with the metronome, I'd recommend just setting that tempo really slow, like maybe setting it at 70 beats per minute here. So once you have this metronome going, you can just practice playing on top of it, right? That click is letting us know where the beats are in the measure and how fast the song is going. It takes a little while to get used to that, so don't be surprised if it's a little bit frustrating at first. I think about the metronome as kind of your know-it-all friend who always tells you when you're wrong and when they're right, and they're right all the time. <laughs> But the bad thing about the metronome is that there's not really a cost to starting or stopping within the song itself, right? So I can play through that song and add in an extra beat, but still technically stay with the metronome, right? <laughs> right? So that's why I really recommend playing with backing tracks is because you have the structure of the song built into your reference. When you play along with the backing track, you can hear how the chords link up to the melody and how you should line up with the rest of the band at specific points in the song. And that's why I spend a lot of time making these backing tracks for these videos, because I think it's so helpful to hear the song in context and be able to play along with a full bluegrass band with bass, with guitar, with banjo and mandolin to hear what it sounds like to play in that setting. And of course, you can grab those MP3s over at my Patreon page at the link above. And I've got different tempos for all the songs so you can practice it at whatever level that you're comfortable. At. All right, now tip number five, which is really specific, which is keep a list of all the tunes and all the things that you want to learn. I can't tell you the number of times I've sat down to play the mandolin and have not been able to think of something new to work on. And I'll end up playing something I already know, like Buffalo Gals or something like that. And part of practicing well, I think, is working on new things, you know, expanding our repertoire, expanding our knowledge of music and all sorts of things like that. So keep a list and have it ready at all times. When you sit down to practice, you can go back and reference that list and work on something new that you thought of in the past. All right, practice tip number six here is be kind to yourself in your practice sessions, which might seem a little bit of a cop out and kind of contradictory to some of the stuff I've talked about before, but you know, it's a delicate balance that we have to walk here. So when I come to practice, I do want to set that standard really high for myself, but I also want to be understanding if and when I don't meet that expectation. And that's the thing that you'll encounter as you keep playing music is that usually your expectations for your musical ability grow twice as fast as your actual 
ability does. So you kind of have to check yourself if you're being unrealistic and you're not able to meet those goals or those standards that you have. And you just have to be kind to yourself and remember to enjoy playing mandolin because this instrument is fantastic, right? It's so much fun to play. And speaking of having fun and getting better here, that brings us to tip number seven, which is go out and play music with other people as soon and as often as possible. And I know that idea of playing with other musicians, especially as a beginner, can be really intimidating. And you may not ever fully feel ready to actually start playing with others, but it's actually one of the best ways that we can get better. When you're playing with other people, it's a totally different ball game, right? I've heard people say that you should only expect 70 to 80% of what you've played in the practice room to be able to come out when you're in high pressure situations, like when you're in the jam or you're playing on stage, <laughs> which I know is kind of a discouraging idea, but the more you go out and play with other people, the easier this gets and the better you're gonna get as well, because when you're playing with other people, you kind of have this hyper awareness of what's going on in your own ability. You start to see your weak points a lot more clearly whenever you try it out in real life with other people and you start to see what other people are doing and you get inspired to try new things and learn things a lot faster. And if you've never gone out and played with people in a real jam before, no worries, I've got you covered. That's what this next lesson in our beginner series is all about, getting ready for the jam. So stay on the line here for part 16 of the Complete Beginner's Guide to Mandolin. In the meantime, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, join us over on Patreon. As always, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.